Hey guys, welcome back to another Rust tutorial. In this video, we'll be going over variables and data types, pointers and references, and variable shadowing. Let's get into it. Rust provides a good variety of primitive data types available to developers. In this video, I will only be covering a few of them, but if you want to learn more, the Rust documentation is very extensive with a list of all the primitive Rust provides. In Rust, we use the let keyword to declare variables. We start by writing the let keyword, followed by a variable name of your choice, followed by a colon, then the type of the variable. Then we can have an equal sign followed by a value assigned to our variable. In this case, we declared the variable x of type u32, which is an unsigned 32-bit integer, followed by an equal sign and the value 10 plus 6, which evaluates to 16. Let's create a few more variables. We'll have a variable named y of type f32, a 32-bit floating point number, and give it the value 12.4. Some other primitives in Rust is a boolean, denoted by the keyword bool, which can be assigned either true or false. Rust also has a character type indicated by the char keyword and represents a single Unicode character. This differs from chars in C, C++, or Java, where a char is one byte. In Rust, chars are always four bytes in size, so it can store any Unicode character such as emojis or non-Latin characters. In this case, we'll store a cat face emoji in our char. Rust also has a string slice type, which is a borrowed string value that we will learn more about in future videos. Okay, now let's print all these variables onto the screen. One feature that Rust has is type inferencing. If you've worked with statically typed languages in the past, such as C or Java, they require you to manually write out and specify the type of each and every variable. The Rust compiler is a bit smarter than this. It allows you to not specify the types of your variables if the compiler is able to inference or figure out that information on its own by looking at the rest of your code. For example, Rust knows the result of 10 plus 6 is going to be some integer. So Rust will assign x to be some integer type such as i32, i64, or i size. Same with 12.4, the Rust compiler may assign y to be f32 or f64. ch will be of type char and s will be of type string slice, even if we remove their types from our code. Even if we create a new variable and assign it the value of another variable, the Rust compiler is able to understand what the variable's type is and assign the new variable to be of the same type. And if we recompile our program, we can see that it still runs perfectly. Next, we'll be talking about some more advanced data types. The first one is a tuple, which you can think of as a collection of values grouped together in order. Let's make one that consists of an unsigned 8-bit integer, a character, and a string slice. Now let's assign it some values. Tuples are fixed in size and immutable, meaning you cannot change the amount of values it can hold, and the values inside of tuples cannot be changed. You can only create new tuples from old tuples. Another type is an array, which is a collection of values of the same type grouped together in order. We'll make one consisting of three string slices and give it some values. Like tuples, arrays are also fixed in size, but they are mutable, meaning you can reassign values to its elements. Now let's print these values out. We can access the fields in the tuple using the dot operator, followed by an index number. 0 will get you the first element, 255, 1 will get you the second element, h, and 2 will get you the third element, hello. Accessing the elements of an array is very similar, except this time we use brackets instead of the dot. As we can see, it printed out the values as expected. When you are debugging your code, printing a really big tuple or array element by element can become very tedious. So Rust provides a feature called debug print. 
By putting a colon or question mark inside the squiggly brackets of our print line statement, we can easily print the contents of a variable. The data type just needs to support this feature. Fortunately, all Rust primitives support this feature, and adding the debug feature into your own code is very simple. Let's print it out again, and we can see its outputs contain all the values of our array and tuple. We can also add the pound sign to print them out in a more readable format. And again, type inferencing works on all data types in almost all cases, so we can remove the data types we wrote and run to see it still works. Another feature of Rust is something called variable shadowing. If you've ever worked with dynamically typed languages in the past, such as Python, you know that variables don't really have a type associated with them. You can just reassign them to different types on the fly. Rust has something very similar, though not as flexible because it is a statically typed language. By simply redeclaring a variable using the let keyword, we can associate that variable to a new data type. This reduces the amount of variables we need to keep track of and eliminates the variables that are only used to produce another value. Let's see what happens when we change my tuple to my array. We now see that during the first print statement, my array is a tuple, but during the second print statement, we've reassigned it to be an array. Finally, I want to touch on pointers and references. A pointer, or a reference to a variable, is the memory address of that variable rather than the actual value that variable holds. This can be useful when we don't want to copy our data around, or it is simply too expensive to copy around. To get the memory address of a variable, we use the ampersand operator. This is called referencing. To get the value that a pointer points to, we use the star operator. This is called dereferencing. You can think of them as opposites of each other because they cancel each other out. We can also have double pointers by getting the pointer of a pointer. And Rust is very smart about this in that it will automatically dereference your pointers to get to the value, as we can see from our print statement. As always, we can always manually dereference them ourselves. And notice how we got an error when we tried to dereference a variable that wasn't a pointer. Okay, that's it for this video. Leave a comment down below if you thought it was helpful or you think that there could be improvements made. And I'll see you guys in the next one.